Well, my brand is basically a strong female presence, multi-instrumentalist, a writer, an entertainer. That's really what I prefer to do more than anything else. I love to entertain. I love to work the crowd. High energy, improvisation, which sets me apart from other folks who do a lot of the same, I feel, is that I can improvise. Lots of violinists who come into the scene, they're coming from a classical background, and they need to memorize their parts, which is fine. Um, but I have the ability, thank God, to improvise, to get up there and to shred and to have that sort of energy like a guitar player because that's the presence I think you should have on stage. And it's a strong stage presence and the funky crazy hair doesn't hurt. That each time you flip a dime Half the time it comes up heads And tails the other time I never seem to win at love Why do I even try? I'm attracted to the wrong kind of guy I see some James Dean look like And there I go again with just bad men a cavalcade of losers is forever passing by i'm attracted to the wrong kind of guy loud mouth chiefs gates who treat me I'll never play your song The list goes on and on star instrument unless you think of Charlie Daniels but that's kind of more country and fiddle right fiddle and the fiddle and the violin are the same instrument by the way folks are often asking me is that a fiddle or is that a violin and I said 
It's both, my friend. Depends how you play. But uh, no, I mean, I actually started with the viola, as odd as that is, right? La viola. Because it was assigned to me when I was in third grade, or third grade growing into fourth, so like nine years old. It was assigned to me at Haverford, where I went to school. He said, hey, guess what? You got to choose an instrument. And I said, okay, I want something low. The viola actually has a nice low tone to it, or a good viola. Mine didn't. <laughs> but then I eventually got a nice one. So then I started playing in all these different orchestras. I, you know, spent a lot of time working on scales, which helped me now with being able to improvise so easily because I spent so much time with the technical aspect. Uh, again, scales and just shedding and all of that. And I don't regret it. And you, you know, you got to read that odd alto clef. That is an odd clef. Uh, so I learned with all that. It gave me some discipline. Gave me some uh, good chops, I suppose, right? And then I did choir as well. I should have done the shows, never had time. I was definitely a theatrical person, but it is what it is. I make up for it now on stage. And then when I was in college, that's really when I switched over and said, I want to do violin, because that's usually identified more with bands than the viola. Okay. You can get a five string. Now, if you get a five string, that is like a hybrid. I do not have a five string yet, but I'd like to get one. But right now, I just use this and a few others, and I just hook them up. Nice little pickup right there. I put them through pedals, a preamp, an amp, just like a guitar player. And it sounds great. It sounds fantastic. <laughs> How do you unlearn loneliness when it's all you've ever known? How do you relearn tenderness when you're frozen to the bone? How to intake loveliness when it's ugliness you've sown? Your saving grace is far too late for I am old and dead. How do you speak truthfulness when it's lies you've always told? How do you find it holiness when sin is oversold? How do you make peacefulness when war is rich in gold? Your charity is past its date, my story's all been told. You're trying hard to break me, but it just ain't gonna play. My miserable madness suits me, and there ain't no other way. You're working hard to save me and put me in a bin. But my freedom's one defines me, and your Jesus just can't win.
and then, I mean, really, I, why did I go into rock and roll and, and more improvisatory music? Because it's improvisatory. I like to have fun up on stage. I don't like to be stuck to a page. I don't like to be in this giant blob of an orchestra where I have to conform. That's not me. So that's why I eventually moved out of doing that. And then now I'm doing more, again, popular music, rock and roll. Really, the music I do, I, so big band, you're going to hear some of that vintage sounding sort of material. I long for your sweet embrace, dear. I long for your sweet embrace. So, when did you decide that you wanted to make this your, basically your career? Well, that's an awesome question because, uh, you know, I kind of went back and forth for years because I also taught full time for the school district of Philadelphia. I was even working um, for Penn part time through the school district. And then plus I was doing some other things with Settlement Music School as well, teaching lessons on my own. And I finally said, you know what, life's too short. I really love performing. I love going out there and doing my own solo gigs when I'm singing more vintage music. I'll do that sometimes at um, senior livings as well. I love that because it's really more music therapy. And it speaks to me like nothing else. It's healing. And so that's really what I would like to do. I still enjoy teaching, but that would have to be more in the studio. You know, like a private studio, individual or small group lessons is also something I enjoy, especially working with um, kids with special needs. But um, in regard to teaching full time in that sort of general music setting where you're working with 30 kids, and you know, no one ever really appreciates the arts teacher. You're always an extra thing that, well, we don't really need that. You know, I'm done. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is my thing. This is my shtick. <laughs> the, uh, you said it speaks to you. Yes. What does that, it's, you know, what does speak to you? Well, basically, I literally, I go somewhere else when I'm performing. I don't know. There's, I got to research this uh, more because actually I live next door to the sister of probably the most prominent music therapist in this particular area of the country. And I'm telling you, there's something about music that you literally are transported, you know, and it's something psychological, cerebral that happens that, I don't know, you just transcend and it is healing. So to me, I could perform every day. I just, I go somewhere. And especially, like I said, when I'm improvising, because that is something that is just in the moment, like jazz, you're just speaking in the moment and you're just expressing yourself through an instrument or vocally. I wish that somehow I could see you. Well, that was a few years ago because a wonderful friend of mine, uh, an amazing songwriter who is very understated because he's just a humble human being, Jim Powers needed a vocalist on some of his material. And then that's when I really started collaborating with him. And it was very vintage sounding material, so it worked perfectly for my voice. That's kind of the timbre of my voice is that sort of classic 1940s female sound for some of this stuff. And so, and so that's really when I became more interested. And I said, oh, wow, there's really something here. Da -da -dum. Then I started doing more of my own material. Still had a bit of a vintage twist to it. And I worked here at the studio Philly Jam with Mark Montoro, who is an amazing sound engineer. And I started doing, uh, you know, more of my own pieces because I felt moved to do so. Well, you know, my Italian mother was listening to some of my material the other day. And she said, why are all your songs about somebody breaking your heart? <laughs> I said, because it's, it's easier to write when you're upset. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, who's penning a song about, there's what, one song about being happy? Because I'm happy. That's like the one, you know, everything else. Well, there's positive love songs, but for the most part, they're about striving for something, passion, lost love. My heart in refuge Waiting This one's a bit controversial, but this is something I wrote. It has the viola. There we go with that lovely instrument, right? It has the viola in it. Um, this is one I did not collaborate with Jim Powers on this one. This was, this was one that I did all with my own crazy mind, as you will see in a second. It's a very Eastern sort of sound to it. You got Joey Tyune on percussion. He's fantastic. Um, Eric Worthington on bass. Brilliant, brilliant uh, lineup there. I. And of course, amazing production by Mark. Yes, this is called Redefine the Remedy, and this actually has nothing to do with love. It's a bit political. But once you hear the song, you'll figure it out. The writing's on the wall. It's time to heed the call. To legalize it all. You know, I was playing around with some Eastern or Arab scales on the viola, and I said, you know what, I got a really cool melody line going here, I should put words to it. And so I wrote something about, um, well, a controversial political topic that I just felt moved to write about. Probably something most folks agree with at this point, but we'll see. The plant that gives us hope from cancer's mold that grow, the cure is in the dough. I would say I usually hear a melody first, and then I go from there. I remember this one that I was at a hotel up in um, Rhode Island. Yeah, Providence, Rhode Island, right? I'm like, what's the name of the city? Providence. But, um, which was Providence, because I came up with a really cool melody, and then the lyrics came immediately. 
but it's always for me it's always a melody first and i'm, I'm really a big advocate of a, a, a lush strong melody line which is probably why i like a lot of the songwriting from the 30s 40s 50s 60s you know the great american songbook and the 20s <laughs> Well, um, I, know I went to a, a great school, Haverford High School, and they had a fantastic orchestra, they had a fantastic choir. And then uh, recently I started working with a gentleman called Don Marazzo. He studied uh, at Curtis Institute of Music, which is a huge music school. It's in Philly. And um, yeah, he's fantastic. And he just was helping me a lot with um, you know, protecting my voice and getting more sound out of my voice. Because it's easy to uh, to settle and say, you know what, my voice is good enough, my chops are good enough, but now there's always more to learn, much more. It takes a lot of energy. Oh yeah. That, it um, takes a lot of energy. Let's redefine the remedy and go get high. Of course the man has tried to hide it. The underdog just won't be silent. The people spoke. It's, uh, it's who I am, you know? I mean, everybody has their own identity. Some people identify themselves as, you know, with their family, with this, with that. I mean, this is my art, this is my life, you know? And I mean, Viktor Frankl, uh, Viktor Frankl, excuse me, talks about meaningful work. And that, that can give somebody a sense of purpose. And my work is very meaningful to me. And that's really where my heart is, is where my soul is. So I'm not gonna, throw away my soul, I'm not going to throw away my art, and that's why I keep doing it, as crazy as it seems, especially now since I left a good job with, you know, a pension and all those typically American things that are labeled as safe and good. I'm not there. I can't. It's not my world. <laughs> I need to, to take risk. Uh, do you ever see yourself not doing a ton of work? Did you ever walk away from it? No. It's just part of who you are. So it is. This is what you were meant to be. Exactly. I do love being in the studio and hearing things come together. That's amazing. That is an awesome moment when you're kind of like, okay, this can work. This is a song. But I also love being on stage and when the crowd is just going and you're getting that feedback and you know you're giving it your all and the crowd is responding, that is a beautiful thing. But uh, I mean, I also love learning new things and going to different workshops and seminars and learning ways to perfect my craft, whether it's in the business realm like I said, I like to take risks. Or whether it's in the, uh, the mechanical realm of approaching the instrument. And the, uh, the technical realm. I love to learn new things. So that intellectual aspect as well intrigues me. And music is the most inexhaustible subject. It's schedule one, they claim. The Screaming Orphans, and they're from Ireland. And they play, you know, all over the place, and they play a lot of festivals in the U.S. And so we see them, we run into them. Lovely, brilliant artists, Screaming Orphans. Um, but I remember the lead singer from that came up to me and she said, you know, it's so great to see a female with a strong presence on stage and just in general. She's like, you just don't see that. I'm like, why? You know? And in regard to the business end, yes, people are always taken aback when they see that, you know, I'm going to have... I shouldn't say a more male approach, but that's unfortunately how it's viewed, you know, in business. And I'm not just gonna be like, oh no, that's okay, I can do that session for free, or, um, you know, this is how I'd like things to be. I mean, when I come in and I'm assertive, I need things to be this. This is what I need. This is how it's gonna. This is how it's gonna happen. It would be okay if a guy had that sort of presence, but when a woman has it, suddenly it's offensive. And unfortunately, we're still stuck with that double standard. I don't know why in this century. That still exists, but it does. And that's just my personal experience. Now, once people see that you have chops 
and that you're bringing your best to the table, they typically back off. But still, some guys are taken aback by the strong energy. For Sam, there is no shame. They crucify its name. Well, like I mentioned before about shredding on stage like a guitar player and about, you know, having a pedal board and whatnot. I don't observe that with a lot of other female players. And so when I show up and I got my whole rig going, you always get these looks from guys like, oh, does she actually know how to handle that? Can she actually like work that amp and, and figure out these pedals and, and, and really shred? I mean, and they are always shocked when they see how strongly I take on that stage. I mean, even the other day I was having a discussion with a, a new band. I, I'm another thing. I've got like 50 billion different projects. It's, it's really insane, but it's good. I like to be busy. I like to keep multiple options open. So I always got other things in the works. But um, this other group I was talking with, and they made some comment about a particular element from the performance the previous night that was aimed at me. And once they saw my response, that I just wasn't going to nod and be like, oh, okay. They saw my response was like a whole analysis. They're like, all right, we're going to back off this chick. <laughs> but we will make it known. And we are not alone. The truth should not be zoned. I just... I'm thankful every day for the opportunity to play music. You know, I thank God that I have this, again, this amazing experience in my life. Uh, it's really just, yes, I do a lot of networking. So certain things I could say that I controlled the situation perhaps, but a lot of it is just fate. Like what happened here with, as I mentioned, with Mark and Tom and, um, and Barley Juice, these pieces just kind of fell into place. And I'm just very grateful. Let's redefine the remedy and go get it high. Of course the man has tried to hide it. The underdog just won't be silent. The people spoke and they decided. The time is right to legalize it. I mean, I, I want to give a big shout out to, um, to Barley Juice. I mean, I fell in with them during a very difficult time in my life, so that was meant to be. They've been a great teacher to me, and it's been awesome going out on the road with them. Uh, I want to give a big shout out to, like I said, Mark Montoro here of Philly Jam. Also, there's another gentleman who comes here, Tom Thurow, who's been a, a great inspiration for me, another fantastic musician. 